I come visiting a country, it's because I found some Nazis. <laughs> in this case, I haven't found any Nazis in Turku or in Helsinki or anywhere else in Finland. But uh, rather the appearance, uh, the publication of the book in, in, in Finnish, which uh, I'm very happy about. And I want to thank the uh, Finnish Anti-Fascist Committee for publishing the book and making it available to people who otherwise uh, wouldn't read it or to, to people for whom it's easier, obviously, to read in, uh, in, in Finnish. Um, the people that we're trying to bring to justice now are, as you all understand, very old. And as a result of that, there are people who wonder whether it's still important to bring Nazis to justice. So I want to begin with my answer to that question and uh, give you the moral, the legal moral philosophical foundation for what we're doing, and then talk a little bit about the people themselves and tell you some of the stories uh, about the cases that I've dealt with. So, first point is that the passage of time in no way lessens or diminishes the guilt of the killers. If someone committed a crime in 1941 or 44, not brought to justice, the justice guilty today. Number two is that old age should not protect killers. In other words, just because someone reaches the age of 85 or 90 or even more, it doesn't turn a mass murderer into a righteous Gentile. Third point is, and this is a point that was always emphasized by Simon Wiesenthal himself, the obligation that we owe the victims of the Shoah. In other words, these people who were murdered simply because they were considered enemies of the Third Reich of Nazi Germany, primarily the Jewish people, but not only the Jewish people, in other words, Gypsies, homosexuals, and Jehovah's Witnesses, etc., they deserve that an effort be made to find their killers. Fourth point is that it sends a very powerful message when we bring these people to justice. And I'll give you a statistic that might surprise you. Uh, every, every year we publish this report, um, Worldwide Investigation and Prosecution of Nazi war criminals. You can find, find this on uh, our website, which is www.operationlastchance, one word, .org. And since 2001, this, this is basically statistics, information of all the investigations going on all over the world, all the trials, all the convictions, etc., etc., etc. And um, since 2001, there have been 90 successful legal proceedings against Nazi war criminals. 90. I'm sure that's a lot more than what you thought. Um, and as of a year ago, actually 15 months ago, or less than 15 months ago, there were over 1,350 investigations against Nazi war criminals going on all over the world. Okay? So this is part of... This is part of uh, our obligation to the victims, it's sending a message that if you commit crimes like this, even many years later, there'll be someone who's trying to bring you to justice. And I would add one, one last point, that um, in this age where uh, we have a problem of people who are trying to either deny the Shoah or rewrite the history of the Shoah for political reasons, and that's happening now mostly in post-communist Europe, countries of Eastern Europe that used to be either part of the Soviet Union or were part of communism, they're rewriting the history of the Shoah because they're trying to hide their own crimes. In other words, the people in those countries collaborated. First of all, people all over Europe collaborated with the Nazis. But in Eastern Europe, the collaboration included participation in mass murder. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, Belarus, Croatia, countries like this, the locals did a very large percentage of the game. Each country is different, obviously. Each country has its own uh, nuances, its own history. But uh, these, these countries are now trying to uh, change the way we understand the history of the Shoah. They're trying to say that the crimes of communism are equal, if not worse, than the crimes of the Holocaust. And they basically want to 
undermine the special status of the Shoah as a unique case of genocide. In other words, today, the civilized world, not the Arab world, we're not talking about Ahmadinejad. We're talking about the normal world of the West. In that world, they understand that the Shoah is a unique tragedy. It's unique, first of all, because of the fanatic determination of the Nazis to totally wipe out every Jew, it's not only the Jews of Europe. That was the immediate plan, but ultimately the plan was to kill every Jew in the world, okay? to totally destroy the Jewish people. And the fact that it's the first and only instance ever in the history of mankind in which you had industrialized mass murder. In other words, special installations built which could massacre, which could murder thousands of people during one day. Now it's going to reach 12,000 people in Treblinka, other death camps, thousands of people every day, murdered simply because they're Jews. Okay. So when these trials are held in Eastern Europe, it's particularly important to, to show, to prove to these societies the role of the local killers. Because this is something that they're trying to hide. <clears throat> now, two, two quick observations. One is that um, I don't know how many of you watched the trial of Imam de York in, in Minchum last year. Uh, it's very shown on television many times, but not the whole trial, obviously, but parts of it. And um, two things. First of all, de York tried very hard to look as sick as possible. He lay, lay there sometimes on this, like, uh, what you call it? What? No, 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 no. He wasn't paralyzed at all. But he laid there as if on a bed, making believe he's so sick that he wants you to think that this is the wrong thing to do. He wants you to think that there's no that this trial serves no purpose whatsoever. Okay? Now, first of all, I have some news for you. And that is that the minute the trial sessions ended every day, it was completely different than New York. Okay? He got up, he started walking around, talking to everybody, you know, hello, how are you, what's going on? Okay, that's number one. But there's another question here that's asked, which is a very interesting question. That is the following. That New York was put on trial because he was an SS guard. He actually volunteered to be an SS guard in the Sobibor death camp. Sobibor death camp, a quarter of a million Jews were murdered in some 15 months. But then Yok was not the commander of the camp. He wasn't the deputy commander of the camp. He wasn't even an officer. What is the responsibility of a person like this? This is an important question. So I want to make clear to you that from the Nuremberg trials on, international law, which was basically created because of the Shoah, okay, recognized individual criminal responsibility that every person is responsible for the crimes that they commit. And it's not sufficient, it's not enough for someone to say, excuse me, I had no choice. I received an order from a person who had a higher rank than me. That is not an acceptable legal defense. Because if you were to accept a defense like that, we would be left with one Nazi war criminal. And that's, of course, ridiculous. When you're talking about something like the Shoah, with the extent, with the extent of the Shoah, you're talking about a, a, the, uh, basically the most uh, worst case of genocide in human history. And something like this does not happen because of one person. Okay? The Shoah was carried out by many people, of many different ranks, in many different capacities. And all of them share a responsibility for that result. Now, obviously, the Menuk is not Hitler. The Menuk is not Himmler, right? But he has responsibility, and that's why he was put on trial in, in, in Germany. That's one observation. Second observation is this, and this I think is very interesting. You know, for, for years to this day, one of the big questions about the Shoah is the psychology of the murders, of the murderers. But what's behind this? What made these people, or why did these people commit, commit these crimes? So, many times I'm asked, you know what? So many years have gone by since these crimes were committed, 
the people who committed them are probably sorry. This is what people say to me. Okay? And I, I would strengthen that question by adding that in the last 20 years, there is so much information about the Holocaust. Books, theater, movies. Take a movie like Schindler's List. So popular, seen by millions of people. So some of these people who committed these crimes could have seen this information. Not to mention, by the way, all of the information on the internet. Right? And if they don't use the internet, they have children, they have grandchildren. There's a lot of information they could have, they could have found. And they could have thought about it, and they could have said, listen, you know what? What we did, the things that we did at that time, that's what was the Holocaust. And you know what? We made a mistake. We did something terrible. And there's, there's certain, I mean, there's also explanations they could say. We were young. We were stupid. We were brainwashed. We didn't know what we were doing. We were convinced the Jews were the enemy. So let me tell you something interesting. I'm doing this now for 32 years. Okay? I worked for six years with the U.S. Justice Department, the Office of Special Investigations, as a researcher in Israel for them, working on Nazi war crimes cases. For the last 26 years, I've been the chief Nazi hunter at the Simon Musical Center worldwide. Okay? I've dealt with dozens and dozens of cases of these people. Helped bring many of them to investigation, to justice, etc. I've never ever had a single case in which a Nazi war criminal ever expressed any regret or any remorse. Not one. Now, there have been in the history, okay, since the Shoah, a few cases of Germans who reached that conclusion. Okay? Very few. Okay. Not a single Eastern European, by the way, not a single non-German, and none of the people that I dealt with. And this is a really horrific thing, if you think about it. In other words, these people have learned absolutely nothing. They had more, they had more than, in some cases, it depends when we caught them, depends when we exposed them, okay, they had 50 years, 60 years to think about it. It's a lot of time. And there's a lot of information out there that could have led them to say that they made a mistake. But not a single one did. On the contrary, some of the people that I've been involved in, the cases that I've been involved in, were very proud of what they did. To this day, they're very proud of what they did. So one of the stories that, I, that if you read the book, I want you, obviously I want you to read the book, that uh, I want you to especially read, okay, is the story of a man called Dinko Shakich. <clears throat> Dinko Shakich was the commander of one of the worst concentration camps in World War II, but one of the least known important concentration camps, a camp called Yasenovats. Yasenovats was in Croatia, and uh, at least 100,000 people were murdered in that camp, mostly Serbs, but 18,000 Jews, thousands of Roma, and anti-fascist Croatians. So, just a couple of words about the historical background to explain what, what, what it was. In April, I think it's April 6, 1941, Germany attacked Yugoslavia, and in a matter of days, occupied the whole country, and cut up Yugoslavia into many different pieces. One of the pieces, for example, Macedonia, was given to Bulgaria. Other pieces were divided. The Nazis also set up with the Italians a satellite state called the Independent State of Croatia. Now, just for the record, Croatia had never existed for 900 years before this independent state was created. And what the Nazis did, this sounds almost, well, this is what Nazis do. They turned over the rule of this independent state of Croatia to a fascist movement called the Ustasha. And the Ustasha, the first goal when they took control of the country was to rid, get rid of all the minorities in Croatia. In other words, they were Croatian Catholics, fanatic anti-Semites, fanatic anti-Serbs, okay? And their goal was to get rid of everybody else. 
not only everyone who was not a Catholic Croatian, but also everyone who didn't agree with him. In other words, people who opposed him politically, anti-fascists. So they set up these concentration camps all over the country. The largest camp was Yesenovac. And they began deporting their enemies, these so-called enemies of the independent state of Croatia, to these camps where they were murdered. No gas chambers, no gas vans, individual murders by bullet, by grenade, by daggers, by swords, in some of the most horrific ways you could ever, you could, you could ever imagine, that earned this camp the nickname of the Auschwitz of the Balkans. Dingo okay. Shakic was one of the communities of this terrible Yesenovac. And like many of the Croatian war criminals, after the war, he ran away to Argentina. Now, you all know that Argentina was a big haven for Nazi war criminals. Most of the Nazi war criminals who ran away to Argentina were Germans and Austrians, like Adolf Eichmann, the coordinator of the Final Solution, was kidnapped by Israel, brought to trial in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. Dr. Mengele, Joseph Mengele, the famous doctor from Auschwitz, ran away to Argentina. Josef Schwamberger, Edward Rushman, there, there are many of them, okay? Um, but there, there were also a few Eastern, the only Eastern Europeans who ran away to Argentina were actually Croatians. Now, how did these people get to Argentina? There was an escape network set up by a bishop called Alice Hudel, an Austrian bishop who lived in Rome, and they set up safe houses in monasteries, and in other places along the way for the people to escape via the Alps from Germany and Austria into Italy. They reached Genoa, where they were given false passports, new names, false passports, tickets, ship tickets to Buenos Aires. Okay. So Dinko Shakic was one of those people. And um, after Croatia became independent again in 1991, we started uh, looking for him. And we found him. We found him with the help of an Argentinian journalist. He was living about 250 miles south of Buenos Aires in a, in a town called Santa Teresa. And uh, what we did was, in order to help this journalist who was going to do the expose on Shakic, we had him meet, there were a few survivors of Esenovac who lived in Belgrade. We had him meet those survivors who could tell him firsthand what they saw while they were in the camp, in the terrible tortures, the executions, the mass murders, etc. Okay. So this journalist, Jorge Camarasa, his name is, he deserves credit, he did a very good thing, very good job. He takes a team from Argentinian television and goes to Shakic's house in Santa Teresa. Okay. He of course doesn't tell them ahead of time that he's coming. Like, he doesn't call to make an appointment, okay? So uh, he knocks on Shakic's door, Shakic opens the door, you did go Shakic, yes. Uh, you would come down to the Senovac, yes. Can I come in and ask you a few questions? No problem. They come and sit down in Shakic's living room, and Kamarasa says to me, Mr. Shakic, you are the commandant of the Senovac. How do you explain what went on in that camp? So Shakic says to me, What's the problem? The Senovac was a penal colony, like a jail. Every country has its jails. That was the Senovac. So Kamarasa says to him, listen, you know, you can't fool me. I was just in Belgrade. I met Joseph Erlich. I met some other survivors. They told me the truth. They told me the truth about the camp. The camp was like hell. Tortures, murders every day, okay? What do you have to say? This is one of those lines you never forget your entire life. I saw this on television. I wasn't there. I wasn't in the house with, with Kamarasa. So Shaka says, listen. Listen, you, you, Kamarasa, right, you don't understand. The problem with the Asenovats was that they didn't let us finish the job. Now, this is said in 1998, okay? That is 43, 53 years after the end of the Asenovats. The Asenovats lasted until April of 45. Then Shakic ran away, okay? He had 53 years to think about what happened there. Did it change anything for him? Garnished, cloned, nothing, nada. Okay? Not a single thing. Now, at that point, 
But this story is worth telling because it gives you a little insight into what we're up against, okay? We had a very good dilemma. We obviously wanted to, we wanted to put on trial. He couldn't be put on trial in Argentina, okay? Because the crimes were not committed in Argentina. So the idea was to have him sent to a country that would put him on trial. So there was one country that was dying to put him on trial. That was Yugoslavia, okay? There was another country that might have to put him on trial because the crimes took place on its territory, that's Croatia. So, how do we choose between Croatia and Yugoslavia? So, I'll tell you the pluses and the minuses, okay? The plus of, of Yugoslavia was that we had no doubt that he would be convicted and that within five minutes after being convicted, he would be hung on the highest tree in Belgrade, okay? That's a big plus, no? <laughs> okay? The minus was, who needed the lesson of Yesenovats? Did the Serbs need the lesson of Yesenovats? They didn't need the lesson. They know the lesson very well. Everyone knows about Yesenovats in Serbia and Montenegro. That was then was Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro. Now it's only Serbia. But um, everyone knew about it because the main victims of Yesenovats were the Serbs. And the main victims of the Ustasha all over Croatia were the Serbs. So they didn't need the lesson. What about Croatia? So the big plus, and I have to, I have to explain to you that our policy has always been to put, have the people put on trial in the country in which they committed the crime, or the country which sent them somewhere else to commit the crime. So in other words, if, if, for example, you have, uh, let's say, a German or Austrian who committed these crimes in Latvia or in Estonia, Okay, so they can be tried either in Germany or Austria or in Estonia, for example. Now, what's the attitude in Croatia? Do the people in Croatia need the lesson? They need the lesson and how? Because there are people who to this day have nostalgia for the Ustasha, who think that the Ustasha were heroes. So let me just tell you a couple of quick stories to give you the illustration of what actually went on there. In uh, in the summer of 1998, we're now in the middle of the Euro, as you all know. Finland is not in the Euro, as I'm sure you all know. <laughs> okay, it didn't make it to the Euro. But the Euro is a big deal. But the World Cup is even a bigger deal. Okay? So in 1998, any football fans here? 1998, the World Cup was held in France. And on July 4th, 1998, there was an incredible quarterfinals match between Croatia and Germany. And everyone was expecting Germany to, to win the match because Germany is a great, you know, sports country and they, they have a terrific football team. And Croatia is very actual, Croatia is excellent in sports, but they're a small country, five million people, right? It's like Finland, <laughs> In any event, um, that night I was in Zagreb with my wife and I had given some information into the prosecutor in Zagreb. And I'm walking in the street during the game, and all of a sudden, I'm telling you, literally, the street, the street began to shake. I said, what's going on here? Is there an earthquake? No, no, no. Croatia scored a goal against Germany in the quarterfinals match. Anyway, Croatia won 3-0 in the biggest upset in World Cup history. Okay? And right after the match was over, we left the hotel to go see what's going on. See the celebrations. Anyway, I'm... Um, like a few minutes after I leave the hotel, I'm standing there with Mikey Powell on. And all of a sudden, I see this group of young 20-year-old uh, males walking towards me, waving this gigantic flag. I couldn't see if it was a Croatian flag or a Stasha flag. Could have been either one. And, and they're yelling at the top of their lungs, Dinko Shakic, Dinko Shakic. Dinko Shakic is in jail, okay? He's awaiting trial. He didn't score the goals for Croatia against Germany in the football match, right? So what's the story? I mean, why are they yelling Dinko Shakic? What does Dinko Shakic have to do with this great sports victory, with this great victory in the football match? And the answer, of course, as you all understand, is that in the eyes of many Croatians, Dinko Shakic is a hero. Dinko Shakic is a patriot. Dinko Shakic is a guy who knew how to deal with the enemies of Croatia. The Serbs, the Jews, the Roma, all those terrible people, you know? And this is something that exists to this day. 
Now, to give you an example, I can't resist because the story is so amazing that I have to tell it. It's in the book, okay? It's, there's a whole chapter on Shabbos, okay? The most dramatic testimony of the trial was the trial of a Jewish survivor from Sarajevo. In other words, the independent state of Croatia that included what's today Croatia and most of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Today's Bosnia and Herzegovina and also Sarajevo. It's a big Jewish community, a very important Jewish community. So, uh, as far as Jewish community, by the way. And um, in any event, this, this uh, guy, Yakovic, his name was, he was already 85 <coughs> when he testified. A whole bunch of Jewish kids that age were taken from Sarajevo in 1942 and deported to Yashanov. A couple of days after they arrived in the camp, they were given an order to do the following. The guards had killed a whole bunch of inmates. They, after they murdered them, they cut off their arms and their legs, and there was a whole pile of body parts. They took these boys, and they told them to take their body parts and throw them into the Sava River, which ran right near the Asenovats. So Yaakov Finzi turns around to one of the guards, and he says to him, why are you doing this to us? So the guard said, because you murdered Jesus. Okay? Now, if you want to understand how a Yesenovac is created, you take hundreds of years of Christian anti-Semitism, you add the racism and the anti-Semitism of the Nazis and Ustasha, then you have Yesenovacs. Now, Shakich, by the way, burst out laughing when he heard this story. I was in the courtroom, I heard, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe what was going on. He burst out laughing. But the judge, the Croatian judge, Judge Grazin Triplo, did a phenomenal job conducting this trial. And he immediately shut up Chakic, told him, you say another word, I'm kicking you out of, the, out, of the, out of the courtroom. Now, the good news is that Chakic got the maximum sentence, which was 20 years. By the way, he wasn't put on trial for genocide. And that was a political decision, even though there's no question that what he did was genocide. But to accuse him of genocide was too politically sensitive in Croatia. I have to say one important thing. One of the reasons we were afraid to send him to Croatia was because the president of Croatia at that point was a man named Franjo Tudjman who denied the Holocaust. Even though he, during World War II, had fought against the Ustasha. And his brother had been killed by the Ustasha. But when he became a politician in Croatia in the 90s, he decided he was going to be an ultra-national. So he praised him, you know, he was sympathetic to the Ustasha, he made all sorts of anti-Semitic comments, anti-Serb comments, but in any event, we gambled on it anyway, and um, he, he got the maximum sentence of 20 years in prison, he was 78 years old when he was put into prison, and he died in prison. Now, there's just one little postscript to this story, just to give you an idea. First of all, there's no question the trial was...